The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis. Part 4. The Seventeenth Chapter, Monastic Life. If you wish peace and concord with others, you must learn to break your will in many things. To live in monasteries or religious communities, to remain there without complaint, and to persevere faithfully till death, is no small matter. Blessed indeed is he who there lives a good life, and there ends his days in happiness. If you would persevere in seeking perfection, you must consider yourself a pilgrim, an exile on earth. If you would become a religious, you must be content to seem a fool for the sake of Christ. Habit and tonsure change a man but little. It is the change of life, the complete mortification of passions that endow a true religious. He who seeks anything but God alone and the salvation of his soul will find only trouble and grief, and he who does not try to become the least, the servant of all, cannot remain at peace for long. You have come to serve, not rule. You must understand, too, that you have been called to suffer and to work, not to idle and gossip away your time. Here men are tried as gold in a furnace. Here no man can remain unless he desires with all his heart to humble himself before God. The Eighteenth Chapter The Example Set Us by the Holy Fathers Consider the lively examples set to us by the saints, who possess the light of true perfection and religion, and you will see how little, how nearly nothing, we do. What, alas, is our life compared with theirs? The saints and friends of Christ served the Lord in hunger and thirst, in cold and nakedness, in work and fatigue, in vigils and fasts, in prayers and holy meditations, in persecutions and many afflictions. How many and severe were the trials they suffered, the apostles, martyrs, confessors, virgins, and all the rest who willed to follow in the footsteps of Christ. They hated their lives on earth, that they might have life in eternity. How strict and detached were the lives the holy hermits led in the desert, what long and grave temptations they suffered! How often were they beset by the enemy! What frequent and ardent prayers they offered to God! What rigorous fasts they observed! How great their zeal and their love for spiritual perfection! How brave the fight they waged to master their evil habits! What pure and straightforward purpose they showed toward God! By day they labored, and by night they spent themselves in long prayers. Even at work they did not cease from mental prayer. They used all their time profitably. Every hour seemed too short for serving God, and in the great sweetness of contemplation they forgot even their bodily needs. They renounced all riches, dignities, honors, friends, and associates. They desired nothing of the world. They scarcely allowed themselves the necessities of life, and the service of the body, even when necessary, was irksome to them. They were poor in earthly things, but rich in grace and virtue. Outwardly destitute, inwardly they were full of grace and divine consolation. Strangers to the world, they were close and intimate friends of God, to themselves they seemed as nothing, and they were despised by the world. But in the eyes of God they were precious and beloved. They lived in true humility and simple obedience. They walked in charity and patience, making progress daily on the pathway of spiritual life and obtaining great favor with God. They were given as an example for all religious and their power to stimulate us to perfection ought to be greater than that of the lukewarm to tempt us to laxity. 
how great was the fervor of all religious in the beginning of their holy institution how great their devotion in prayer and their rivalry for virtue what splendid discipline flourished among them what great reverence and obedience in all things under the rule of a superior the footsteps they left behind still bear witness that they indeed were holy and perfect men who fought bravely and conquered the world. Today, he who is not a transgressor, and who can bear patiently the duties which he has taken upon himself, is considered great. How lukewarm and negligent we are! We lose our original fervor very quickly, and we even become weary of life from laziness. Do not you, who have seen so many examples of the devout, fall asleep in the pursuit of virtue. The nineteenth chapter, the practices of a good religious. The life of a good religious ought to abound in every virtue so that he is interiorly what to others he appears to be. With good reason, there ought to be much more within than appears on the outside. For he who sees within is God, whom we ought to reverence most highly wherever we are, and whose, in whose sight we ought to walk pure as the angels. Each day we ought to renew our resolutions and arouse ourselves to fervor as though it were the first day of our religious life. We ought to say, Help me, O Lord God, in my good resolution and in your holy service. Grant me now, this very day, to begin perfectly, for thus far I have done nothing. As our intention is, so will be our progress, and he who desires perfection must be very diligent. If the strong-willed man fails frequently, what of the man who makes up his mind seldom or half-heartedly? Many are the ways of failing in our resolutions. Even a slight omission of religious practice entails a loss of some kind. Just men depend on the grace of God rather than on their own wisdom in keeping their resolutions. In him they confide every undertaking. For man indeed proposes, but God disposes, and God's way is not man's. If a habitual exercise is sometimes omitted out of piety or in the interests of another, it can easily be resumed later. But if it be abandoned carelessly through weariness or neglect, then the fault is great and will prove hurtful. Much as we try, we still fail too easily in many things. Yet we must always have some fixed purpose, especially against things which beset us the most. Our outward and inward lives alike must be closely watched and well ordered, for both are important to perfection. If you cannot recollect yourself continuously, do so once a day at least, in the morning or in the evening. In the morning, make a resolution, and in the evening, examine yourself on what you have said this day, what you have done and thought. For in these things, perhaps you have often offended God and those about you. Arm yourself like a man against the devil's assaults. Curb your appetite, and you will more easily curb every inclination of the flesh. Never be completely unoccupied, but read or write or pray or meditate or do something for the common good. Bodily discipline, however, must be undertaken with discretion and is not to be practiced indiscriminately by everyone. Devotions not common to all are not to be displayed in public, for such personal things are better performed in private. Furthermore, Beware of indifference to community prayer through love of your own devotions. If, however, after doing completely and faithfully all you are bound and commanded to do, you then have leisure, use it as personal piety suggests. Not everyone can have the same devotion. One exactly suits this person, another that. Different exercises, likewise, are suitable for different times, some for feast days and some again for weekdays. In time of temptation, we need certain devotions. 
for days of rest and peace, we need others. Some are suitable when we are sad, others when we are joyful in the Lord. About the time of the principal feasts, good devotions ought to be renewed, and the intercession of the saints more fervently implored. From one feast day to the next, we ought to fix our purpose, as though we were then to pass from this world and come to the eternal holiday. During holy seasons, finally, we ought to prepare ourselves carefully, to live holier lives, and to observe each rule more strictly, as though we were soon to receive from God the reward of our labors. If this end be deferred, let us believe that we are not well prepared, and that we are not yet worthy of the great glory that shall in due time be revealed to us. Let us try, meanwhile, to prepare ourselves better for death. Blessed is the servant, says Christ, whom his master, when he cometh, shall find watching. Amen, I say to you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Chapter 20 The Love of Solitude and Silence Seek a suitable time for leisure, and meditate often on the favors of God leave curiosities alone. Read such matters as bring sorrow to the heart rather than occupation to the mind. If you withdraw yourself from unnecessary talking and idle running about, from listening to gossip and rumors, you will find enough time that is suitable for holy meditation. Very many great saints avoided the company of men whenever possible and chose to serve God in retirement. As often I ha as I have been among men, said one writer, I have returned less a man. We often find this to be true when we take part in long conversations. It is easier to be silent altogether than not to speak too much. To stay at home is easier than to be sufficiently on guard while away. Anyone, then, who aims to live the inner and spiritual life must go apart with Jesus from the crowd. No man appears in safety before the public eye unless he first relishes obscurity. No man is safe in speaking unless he loves to be silent. No man rules safely unless he is willing to be ruled. No man commands safely unless he has learned well to obey. No man rejoices safely unless he has within him the testimony of a good conscience. More than this, the security of the saints was always enveloped in the fear of God, nor were they less cautious and humble because they were conspicuous for great virtues and graces. The security of the wicked, on the contrary, springs from pride and presumption and will end in their own deception. Never promise yourself security in this life, even though you seem to be a good religious or a devout hermit. It happens very often that those whom men esteem highly are more seriously endangered by their own excessive confidence. Hence, for many it is better not to be too free from temptations, but to be tried often lest they become too secure, too filled with pride, or even too eager to fall back upon external comforts. If only a man would never seek passing joys or entangle himself with worldly affairs, what a good conscience he would have! What great peace and tranquility would be his if he cut himself off from all empty care and thought only of things divine things helpful to his soul, and put all his trust in God. No man deserves the consolation of heaven unless he persistently arouses himself to holy contrition. If you desire true sorrow of heart, seek the privacy of your cell and shut out the uproar of the world, as it is written, In your chamber bewail your sins. There you will find what 
too often you lose abroad. Your cell will become dear to you if you remain in it, but if you do not, it will become wearisome. If in the beginning of your religious life you live within your cell and keep to it, it will soon become a special friend and a very great comfort. In silence and quiet, the devout soul advances in virtue and learns the hidden truths of Scripture. There she finds a flood of tears with which to bathe and cleanse herself nightly, that she may become the more intimate with her Creator the farther she withdraws from all the tumult of the world. For God and His holy angels will draw near to Him who withdraws from friends and acquaintances. It is better for a man to be obscure and to attend to his salvation than to neglect it and work miracles. It is praiseworthy for a religious seldom to go abroad, to flee the sight of men and have no wish to see them. Why wish to see what you are not permitted to have? The world passes away, and the concupiscence thereof. Sensual craving sometimes entices you to wander around. But when the moment is past, what do you bring back with you save a disturbed conscience and heavy heart? A happy going often leads to a sad return, a merry evening to a mournful dawn. Thus all carnal joy begins sweetly, but in the end brings remorse and death. What can you find elsewhere that you cannot find here in your cell? Behold, heaven and earth and all the elements, for of these things all things are made. What can you see anywhere under the sun that will remain for long? Perhaps you think you will completely satisfy yourself, but you cannot do so. For if you should see all existing things, what would they be but an empty vision? Raise your eyes to God in heaven, and pray because of your sins and shortcomings. Leave vanity to the vain. Set yourself to the things which God has commanded you to do. Close the door upon yourself, and call to you Jesus, your beloved. Remain with him in your cell. For nowhere else will you find such peace. If you had not left it and had not listened to idle gossip, you would have remained in greater peace. But since you love sometimes to hear news, it is only right that you should suffer sorrow of heart from it. End of Part 4